We will begin in just one minute. Welcome to Introduction to Agile Project Management. Um, obviously, we can't cover everything about Agile Project Management in an hour, but we want to highlight a little bit about a key thought process and, and mindset adjustment that project managers do entail when, when they're starting to embark into an Agile environment. So let's start with a little bit of a, an, an exercise in, in, in thought. I want you to count up these numbers. What's the sum of the numbers on the screen? It's hard when I'm on a uh, webinar to know when you guys are done counting and whatnot. But I'm going to ask everyone to kind of answer this question for me. Um, how did you? How were you counting up the numbers? Maybe you were still counting. And people are arriving as, as we're going to. And so this is part of it. Hopefully when you saw the question a little bit, you realized, okay, some people might be counting from the left to the right. One plus two plus is three, three plus three is six. Others might be counting, we'll start with the larger sum. 10 plus nine is 19, it gets easier that way. Some might have spotted, spotted the pattern of tens. Um, 10, 9 plus 1, 8 plus 2, 7 plus 3, and then add the extra 5. Someone might have spotted the pattern of 10 plus 1 is 11, 9 plus 2 is 11, 8 plus 3 is 11. And really, that's part of the challenge for project managers. In a lot of cases, we spot these patterns. We spot these groupings. We spot something that might make it more efficient, faster. And now the trick is, what do, how do we deal with that information? What do we do about it? Um, in, in project management, a lot of cases, we see an issue, we fix an issue. Um, and, and how does that change when we go into agile project management? And so that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. My name is Trisha Broderick. Uh, I am 100% motivated intrinsically by helping people. Um, I've chosen to take on a coaching training role um, to really open people up to new ways of, of approaching situations, new ways of looking at intentions, new ways of, of helping to empower. And so I've been in software development now for um, several years. I've done a number of different roles from developer to project manager to director of development. Um, I'm currently coaching and training. And, and I'm always trying to have fun with this because at the end of the day, learning and trying new things is, is uncomfortable and hard. And if you can't kind of laugh at yourself, um, it, it makes it even harder. So let's try and um, enjoy that as, as we're going. So foundation for agile project managers. There was a great article done a number of years ago, and, and Mark can pretty much sit back and say, see, told you. Um, he wrote in the Wall Street Journal that Software is pretty much eating the world. Um, even companies that are not primarily driven and, and, and revenue based on software are becoming software companies. Um, pretty much to have competitive advantage, especially in these days, is your software. And so there's a huge potential for our industry and what's happening, and project managers are at the heart of it. Um, a lot of people say, well, project management doesn't exist once you're in Agile, and, and it's getting rid of that role. And I, I don't think there's anything that's further from the truth with that, because in a lot of ways, I, the value that project management brings is customer satisfaction, still there, right? Our focus, our role in a lot of ways is helping to make sure that we're delivering value and, and allowing for that discovery so value is, is achieved 
to our customers. And how we're going about that um, is really more focused in Agile on team satisfaction. Um, when teams are driven by customer satisfaction, when they feel that sense of ownership, when they're having growth, when they're motivated, that customer satisfaction doubles. It increases because now it's not just yourself running around trying to make sure that we're delivering, but really you have an entire team. I know myself personally, I used to say, can I just clone Joe? Um, I wanted to scale by cloning people. Now I scale by really creating solid team performance. And, and it meant that I had to change a little bit of what I did as a project manager. Let's talk a little bit about methodologies and why it's important that how I approach things as a project manager adjust. So you have sequential, very waterfall, right? And then there was iterative and incremental. When we talk about agile nowadays, everybody kind of says, well, it's scrum or it's, it's lean. And, and those are frameworks that support an agile environment. But what's really key is not that it's suddenly iterative and incremental. Iterative and incremental have been around for a very long time. What I say is the power and in, in the unleashed potential that is occurring is really in that collaborative iterative and incremental. And what collaborative really means is it's a behavior of creating together. So if you take a step back and you say, well, we communicate. Well, that's conveying information back and forth. Well, we cooperate. And that is working together. Right, But you could have your own individual goals, drives, results. It can be when you're cooperating, it's still pretty clear who did what and, and who owns what. When you're collaborating, you're working together. You can no longer tell what part was mine, what part is yours. You own it and you create it together. And when you can get true level of collaboration in teams, that customer satisfaction, that team satisfaction just goes through the roof. I was hitting ceilings that I didn't actually even realize I was hitting because we were delivering. We were on budget, on scope, you know, um, within meeting scope, and and it didn't matter, right? It wasn't true high performance. And so, how does a project manager play into building collaboration? Well, one of your strengths, I'm willing to place this bet because I have experienced it myself, and in a lot of cases, it's why a lot of us became project managers, right? You see issues. You spot them, you spot issues before they even become issues, you spot those risks, you spot trouble, right? You see patterns, you see issues, you see experience, you draw parallels, and you're able to see it. And as a project manager, in a lot of cases, I would then fix it, right? I would see an issue, and I would dive in, and I would fix it because that was what we needed to do for the customer, right? At the end of the day, my intentions were very good, right? Delivery. Who doesn't want delivery? Your team's going to look good, you're going to look good, your bosses are going to look good, and most importantly, your customer's going to be happy. The problem with that is, who owns it? Right? Who owns that issue at that point? Did my team ever feel the responsibility to actually fix it or avoid it the next time? Or did they rely on me to do that? And that's when those statements would come in. Why can't I clone so and so? Um, why, you know, I wish I had 24 hours more in a day um, because I was seeing the issues and then I was fixing them. In Agile, project managers really need to still, at the core, really see those issues. Don't lose that strength that you have, see them. But instead of fixing them, shine a big spotlight on them. Find a way to help others see what you can see. Help others figure out and, and spot what you see coming so that they still own the, that issue. They own it. They can see it. And maybe next time, before you even see it, they see it, right? And it's a really a slight difference in who has that ownership. And when they have that ownership, that's when that collaboration can really occur, right? They take hold of it, they feel the accountability, the responsibility, and they collaborate together because in a lot of cases, they need more than just themselves to fix the issue um, with it. So how do you go about doing that? Well, there's a magnitude of ways, right? We're talking about a one hour webinar right now. We're gonna cover just a really small sliver of this. And the sliver that we're gonna cover is two components. How you go about it, what your intent is, what your leadership style is. 
Now, I say intent here. In a lot of cases, this can be intent and perception. So how you go about doing it as a leadership style, what is your intent in terms of building collaboration within the group, ownership within the group, and how are they perceiving how much you want that collaboration within that group? And then the second part we're going to talk about is effective questions. And this is really how you would go about your behavior, your um, oh, an approach. This is only one tool. There are many tools, but one tool is effective or powerful questions. So let's first start with the leadership style, the, the intent and perception of your um, drive towards collaboration. So there are a ton of different leadership styles. I've narrowed the list down to six here. There are actually a few others that I would highly recommend um, you exploring and looking into. But let's go through this list first. Autocratic. This is straight up, you will obey me. I am, I am the power. I am the decider. I am the leader. I have automatic say and you have no say. Now, a lot of people like to make really crass, Dilbert-like jokes that all project manage managers are like this. And I completely disagree with that statement. In my experience, in a lot of cases, when I haven't been trying to do this, it's because in a lot of cases I've been in that fixing mode and I'm almost impatient when I'm trying to fix it and get things done because I want to get, I have OCD, right? And I want to get to point A the fastest. And in order to do that, I don't have time for little things, right? And so I, I hammer through and I'm almost like a bull in a china shop. This can very much be perceived as autocratic by your team. At that point, their willingness to step up, their willingness to take ownership completely negates. And so it's really important that although I never wrote on my knuckles, that I consider how my approach, what my intent is. If it is to get to point A the fastest, what message might that be sending to my team? And how might I have to ask an effective question or do something else in order to make sure that they understand I don't want to take back ownership and, and, and destroy collaboration. The next one is bureaucratic. This is very by the book type leadership. Here's the processes, here's the rules, we need to follow them, you are not following them, get back in line. This is a control. That's the other stereotype that a lot of project managers will have, right? We're command and control. If you had ever asked me if I was a command and control project manager, I would have adamantly told you I was not. But I kind of was. Because I do like process. You know, everybody jokes and says that, you know, no one likes process, right? But I do. I like organization. I like feeling like things are in control. I like having to mitigate risks. And I like reducing down error and improving on things. And you know what? Not all process is bad. It's good. There's reasons for it. There's a balance, right? You don't want process for the sake of process, and you, but you want to question it. And I think that's where I came in the most in understanding that at times my need for that organization, and because so many balls were in the air, prevented them from questioning the rules. And at the end of the day, we want that improvement. We want things to evolve, and I need my team to understand and, 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 and accept that I want them to evolve these rules, not just follow them blindly and, and don't ask questions. And so it's really important that I accept and understand some of my strengths and some of my weaknesses to understand how that impacts collaboration on the team. If you don't feel you can create because you just need to follow these rules, you won't. Which leads into my next um, leadership style and, and really in a lot of cases um, coming straight back to that OCD level, right? I like my check marks. I only gave up my Franklin Planner last year, right? The pa actual paper binder Franklin Planner where I could make my little check marks down my list. I'm a type A personality, if you couldn't tell already. <laughs> I like the check marks. But as a leader, as a project manager, if I'm walking around ensuring everybody's getting their tasks done because I want those check marks, I want confidence that we're on track, who really owns that then? 
right? I own it. At the end of the day, people feel micromanaged, they feel untrusted, and will they collaborate? Will they create as much? Will they feel empowered? No. They're waiting for you to tell them what to do, when to do it, and confirm that they got it done. I had to re <laughs> refocus this energy for myself. Um, I loved project management. I liked my Gantt charts. I actually liked Microsoft Project. Um, it wasn't so much because I wanted to just follow a plan and blindly follow it regardless of whether the customer's satisfied or whether the team needed it. But again, it was back to that organization. It was back to the way for me to see issues, right? That was my way to see issues. I had to learn other ways to see them. I had to spot, become much more of an observer and, and spot things in other ways than by my checklists. Um, and, and that was a difficult transition for me. But I had to understand what me being a task owner, you do this, you do that, I'll do this, actually kept the ownership with me and never gave it to the team. And if I don't give it to the team, they won't take it to that next level. So let's talk about um, democratic. Now this is a leadership style where I want everybody's input, but at the end of the day, I'm going to make the final decision. Now people talk a lot with an agile that project managers, scrum masters, team leads, they should never make decisions, only the team should ever make decisions. And I think in a lot of ways, statements like that is exactly why it's been such a struggle for a lot of people, because it's just not true. At the end of the day, you do have information. It's why you can bring a vast um, value to the company. It's why you can spot a lot of issues. There are times that the team is going to go so far close or so close to an edge and the, 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 the what's the worst that can happen from it is so bad that it is worth you stepping in and making that decision. What's important is instead of going back to autocratic and saying, I don't care what any of you have to say, I'm making the decision, is at the end of the day to be democratic and saying, hey, I want your input. I want to hear what you have to say. I'm making this decision because of these risks. Because of these issues, I need to be the one that makes this final decision. However, I need your input. Now, what that provides is a way for transparency for people to understand why you're making that decision. Um, and that here are the other thoughts. They may not always agree with the final decision, but they will have at least felt like they had a voice in it. And a lot of times that will go a long way. What happens to a lot of people is when they never feel they're heard, that's when they can't um, help or get on board or whatever terms you want to use for that. They want to be heard. And so here are your team. But the, yes, there are times that you may need to step in and be democratic and, and make the decision. Then there's people oriented. And this is really when you're solely focused almost so much, not just on the team satisfaction, but by an individual satisfaction. And that's a really positive thing, right? Because at the end of the day, you can't have a high performing collaborative team if the individuals are not of high caliber. You have to grow people. The struggle with this is when leaders are too people-oriented focused, they can lose sight of the customer satisfaction, right? Um, they can lose sight a little bit of the delivery, and so it's, it's finding that balance. But it is at times being nurturing and being supportive, not just of the team, but of an individual to help them out of their comfort zone. Maybe that tester is, is interested in exploring test engineering. How do you help create that situation? And probably the leadership style that's talked most about in agile environments is servant. Now, servant is um, is is really serving the team. It's, you're behind the scenes. You're really supporting that team. Where this is most effective is at the stage when your team is high performing. If your team is just forming and just getting together, you going back and saying, oh, sorry, I'm not doing any, I, I just help you with whatever you ask for, leaves that team more feeling like they're, been, they're being set up, right? And I think that's been a lot of struggle for a lot of project managers and scrum masters is they're told to be these servant leaders with a brand new project team. And so then they feel, well, how am I providing any value? The team's wondering how they're providing any value because they don't know what to ask for because they're not high performing yet. Servant leadership is best 
when that team is performing. At that point, you're much more mentoring, you're serving, you're connecting, you're helping the team in ways that they need, and you might be giving them that um, extra push, putting them out of their comfort zone and being that safety net for them. But this is a much later stage in, in a team's development than straight out of the gate. And so that's really where you have to look most, is what is, le what is the appropriate leadership style for the situation, right? If you have two different messages being sent to your team, you know, hey, I want to empower you, you're empowered, and I'm going to walk around and be task-oriented all day long, they're going to lean towards you're not really empowering them. And this was a strong message for me, was to realize how many mixed messages I was accidentally sending to my team because of my personality, because of my leadership strengths, because of my style strengths. What messages was that sending to the team that was hurting collaboration, hurting empowerment, and, and ultimately hurting the team from becoming high performance? And, and understanding what my intent was and how that leadership style impacted the team. Okay. The second one is, okay, great. I now know, I see the issue. I know how I might want to, with what leadership style I might want to approach the situation, but what do I do? What do I say? <laughs> and this is where effective questions can come in. Effective questions is really a way to help the team or an individual, but mostly the team, keep ownership and realize the answer for themselves, right? So it's really important that you use open questions. So instead of yes, no answers, but hey, what are some alternatives? What can we think of, right? Asking questions that promote brainstorming, promote listing. You'd be surprised. Um, I did a technique once where I had all the answers in my head, right? Because in a lot of cases, you spot it. You have the experience. You have the knowledge. And so instead of doing what I normally did was shoot them all out of my mouth, right? I wrote them down on a piece of paper and I asked open questions and I asked multiple open questions and I would check off so then I got my check marks right so I, I, I was able to you know satisfy another need of mine and and I wrote down and I was able to check off a number of the things that I was gonna say I think there are so many times that we focus on getting to that delivery as quickly as we can that we don't provide the opportunity to demonstrate and to show just how much knowledge our teams do have Promote participation. At the end of the day, the collaboration only works when they're working together, right? So when they're cooperating and building together, and the only way to do that is by participation by more than one person. Focus outward. What's the possibilities, right? Um, we so often want to get to that next step, but in a lot of cases, when people are learning, they need to explore. They need to go down a little bit of the rat's nest to understand why that might be a bad decision or why that might not, and to have that conversation about it. Ask searching questions. In a lot of cases, when you're in those servant leadership spots, when you're um, when you're trying to understand how you can help the team, ask them. You know, do you have what you need? What else can I, you know, is there anything I can do for you, for you guys as, as a team? Um, I used to walk around and ask that question at the end of each day, and, and most times people would say, nothing, have a good day. And then every once in a while it's like, oh, I didn't think about it, but what about this, right? In a lot of cases you're just taking that I have an open door policy and actually throwing away the door and, and making yourself available. What's really important is that the question should encourage collaboration and inspire insights and ownership from the participants. If I, and I did this all the time, I would accidentally take ownership. Okay, that's a great student. I'll go follow up, right? Part of that was because I wanted to add value to the team, right? Like I wanted to help. If they ask for that, then that can be great. If they don't, you accidentally take ownership. And it's really important that who has the ownership for true collaboration. And so instead, rephrase it. You know, that sounds like a reasonable plan. Give it a try. Let me know, right? Talk, follow up with me. Um, give some boundaries to understand how you might want to interact with that. There may be times you have to take ownership, but it should be your last, last, um, last resort. Use why carefully. Um, I recently uh, was in a session and they said that um, 
hearing the words can I give you feedback is equivalent and triggers the same part of the brain as seeing a bear in the woods. I'm pretty sure why is up there in that same mode. People hear the word why and immediately get defensive. You know, why? What What are you thinking? Why, why don't you tell me? What are, what's going on? And so I've had to almost like, I stuck a sticky note up on my screen and, and for alternative effective questions other than the word why because it can be challenging and people can wonder what's going on. Using effective questions it's not like reading a book. You can't, it's, it's just like you can't read a book that says, here's how to ride a bike, and you get on the bike and you magically ride the bike. You gotta fill it out, right? The very first time um, I get I, I heard about effective questions, it was years ago, and the presenter challenged us to say, go back and for one day, don't answer a single question. Only answer with effective questions. And I thought, oh, I can do that, right? And I went back to my office. And the first, my, one of my project managers came into my office, this is when I was the director of development, and he was asking me questions, and I got about three questions back and wanted to not only shoot myself, but sh just kill this whole situation. Um, I was annoying myself. One of the things with effective questions is, this is something you build up over time right it's a tool it's not a tool that should be used at a hundred percent but it's not a tool that should be used at zero percent it takes time to learn what an effective question is it takes time to understand when to use one it takes time to build a relationship with your team to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and that you're not quote unquote setting them up it takes time for you to embrace and accept that maybe your answer might not be the best answer and you're not asking just effective questions to lead them to your answer but to lead them to their answer. These are all very difficult things that don't just happen overnight. It's something that you learn with time, um, with practice. So let's start a little bit today. Um, let's do a little bit within the hour um, that we have today and, and practice a little bit and, and think about how we might um, approach something from a leadership style and how we might form an effective question. So if you don't have a piece of paper and a pen, you might want to grab one unless you're pretty good with your memory and you just want to fly with it, but otherwise I'll, I'll give you a quick second to grab, um, grab a quick piece of paper, okay? Scenario one, you have a brand new person starting at the company. They are new to the industry and the role. What style of leadership might be most suitable for helping them with onboarding? So they're brand new. They don't know the company. They don't know the industry. They don't know the role. And you need to be helping them with onboarding. What, might, what style might work best? I'll let you think about it a little bit. This might be a situation where task-oriented does work, right? When people are first learning, they're in the state of, they're not sure, they want to follow the rules, they write, they want to be told what to do, how to do it, and, and confirmed and reassured that it's done. Now, here's the trick, you can't stay here, right? That this is a very short term, I'm helping with the onboarding, getting you comfortable, then I need to be adjusting my leadership style so that you continue to grow, right? I might become more people oriented, so focused on making sure you do not become reliant on me as a task oriented leader for you, right? I think so often we kind of say, well, we hire self, you know, in, in, initiative driven people, they don't, um, they don't want our help at all. In a lot of cases, they can come in and they can feel a little overwhelmed, right? Um, they can feel a little um, hung out to dry. Some people do really excel in those situations, but not the, not the majority, right? And, and the trick here is going, okay, I'm going to be task-oriented, but I need to be thinking of my next style, my next game plan of what and how I'm going to make sure that this person does not become reliant on me being task-oriented. Next scenario. You have a high-performing team that is an iteration 15 of the project. They have raised an impediment requesting additional usability research to be conducted. What style of leadership might be most suitable for helping this team? Would you be autocratic? Would you be democratic? What would you be? 
this is a great spot for servant leadership, right? You have this high performing team, they're, they're not in iteration one, they're, they're going on, they're raising an impediment, right? The key thing is you might have spotted that they needed usability research in iteration 14, but they're spotting it in 15 and they're raising it and, and you're going to help the team schedule the usability research, coordinate it, um, whatever might need to be done to help make that happen. This is where servant leadership can really be powerful, right? Um, you're clearing the path to making sure that they can stay high performing. So a final one, final scenario for leadership styles. You identify the high risk that the team is going to miss their deadline. What leadership style is most desired for the situation while helping to, collab, um, helping to keep collaborative teams? I need to rephrase that, I apologize. Right? You have you spot it. You know that they're going to miss. There's a huge potential they're going to miss this deadline. If they do, it's super important, off the cliff, high risk issue. Right? This might be that situation where democratic makes sense. Get their input. Get their ideas. Ask searching questions. Ask open ended questions. But at the very beginning of it, make sure it's very clear that you're making the decision. Sometimes the, the struggle within teams and, and understanding ownership is you, it gets to the end, there's a lot of conflicts, you, don't just, you can't decide who's going to make the decision, so you step in and you just make the decision to, to get it done. Whereas if you start at the beginning and say, I'm going to be making this decision, understand, make that clear, set those expectations, but I need your input, right? Then people know. In addition, if you're not going to make the decision, if you're not being democratic um, in, in your leadership for that situation, don't step in. This conflict is important for them to truly collaborate and build together. Help figure out other effective questions for them. So let's talk and let's practice a few effective questions as well. Okay. So this is, let's just call it a status board because it's not really a Kanban board in the sense that there's no limits and all that good stuff. But for simplicity's sake on a webinar, let's just, let's call this a status board, okay? And it's day two of the sprint. You have three developers and one tester. My guess is, you know, hairs on the back of your neck are going up because you're spotting issues, right? You're seeing things potentially like... There's too much multitasking going on with developers, right? If we have three developers and five tasks, what, what are you guys doing? What's going on? Um, what's happening here, right? You also see, what if they all finish all five of these at one time and there's only one tester, right? There's going to be a bottleneck potential. These are hairs. These are experiences. These are things that you see as project managers. So how do you help get the team to see them, right? How do you shine a spotlight on? So I'm going to give you a, uh, just a minute or so to think of an effective question that you might ask to help the team see one or both of these issues that you're, or another issue that you see. What effective question might you pose back to the team to help them see the problem? maybe came up with something similar to what will happen if someone gets sick this week, right? What's going to ha happen if we everyone finishes development at the same time? Scenario-based, right? Future-based. What, what's potential? They may not respond the first time. That you may experience them to go through it, see the bottleneck. Then it's asking effective questions of how could we have avoided this, right? Some, Sometimes you can't prevent the learning, <laughs> which is a good thing, right? You want the learning. You just want the learning to get faster and faster and faster. And that's where sometimes effective questions before or sometimes after the incident happen. Let's try another one. This is just a velocity chart from a team. They're in their planning meeting for iteration four. You as the project manager have really been honing in on them of delivering their committed um, committed um, story points, right? So the very first time they committed to 40, they delivered something like 31. Second time, because they didn't meet it, they overshot it, right? They went to 60. 
um, but they really were only able to deliver 40. The third time they said, well, I'm, you know, she's really hounding in on we deliver what we committed, so I'm going to under, you know, under promise, over deliver, so we're going to only commit to 20 and we'll deliver 30. You want them to, or what do you see? Let me, let me rephrase that. What do you see as and hope for in this iteration for? Maybe you're hoping, you know, you don't want them to stay in this undercommitted, over deliver state of mind, right? You want them to challenge themselves, but you also don't want them to go so far that they're not delivering what they commit. What's you want them to help them find that target range and and really embrace the target range, right? So I want you to think of what an effective question you might pose to the group, to the team that would help them to acknowledge and 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 um, plan and commit within that target range. Now most will come back with what can this team commit to? Um, and, and that's okay. That's playing it out, right? Um, maybe the team says, well, we're still going to stick to 25, and they just slowly increment up. Maybe they say, nope, we're going to shoot back up to, to 40. I will switch it up occasionally and say, well, okay, if my concern, primary concern is the under-promise, over-deliver, well, why is that a concern? Why is that an issue? So what happens if we over-deliver? How does that impact marketing, right? And, and help the team to think of the dependencies and the, the ramifications of, of that as well. Um, and thinking through and searching and, and considering that. Let's uh, do one more. This is a retrospective meeting notes. Now, I would like to tell you I simplified this just for the webinar, but in all reality, um, these are legitimate actual notes that I saw in a retrospective um, that I was observing and coaching. So, um, so what do you see? <laughs> what do you see that's wrong here? Right? Not vague, not actionable items. Um, I actually asked to see their previous um, retrospective notes, and it was exactly the same, right? What could have been better communication? What are we going to um, do better? Better communication, right? And it's just going to keep repeating itself, right? And then there were no appreciation, right? No, it's time to stop and celebrate and, and acknowledge the growth. Now, it would be very easy for me to see these issues walk in and say, well, these are not measurable. Let's make them measurable right now, right? Um, and or um, and and enforce that but how do I help them see that this is a pattern that they're going to keep going down right or how do I help them acknowledge that they need to celebrate so what's an effective question you would pose back to the group take a minute think about it So how about this? What would have to be true for this team to move communication to the what went well column? So often as project managers, people, you know, oh, you're just about metrics. You just want to look at those things. And I do. I like my metrics, right? But if you pose it back to the group and saying, okay, we've had this in here. What could have been improved nonstop? What would it take for us to actually make it into this what went well? Help them realize that they might need some metrics. Help them realize that they might need to break it down into more of a smart type action, right? Or what would be an event or action that would deserve a celebration? Not even calling out that we forgot, but in the future, right? Thinking future, thinking next. What would be something that we would consider worthy of celebration? This might help give you information that says, hey, I might need to be, you know, drawing more attention to our wins, uh, to, to each other's strengths, whatever needs to be. I can promise you this, it will be challenging thinking of these questions, especially in the moment. 
it, it just takes time and it takes a relationship with your team that they're not looking at you going well she already knows the answer why doesn't she just tell us right um, and and that takes time so let's recap a little bit project managers absolutely have a value I almost wish the titles I would give anything to get rid of titles in a lot of ways because at the end of the day we're talking about leadership you're talking about a leader who is focused in on customer satisfaction and team satisfaction whether you're the project manager the scrum master the team lead the executive in a lot of cases this is what you're focused in on you have to find tools and ways to help make sure that you're creating value-driven software from high-performing teams that's not an easy task in a lot of ways I I argue project management and product management are probably the two biggest role transformations when it comes to agile um, because it's much more about how to empower people to be collaborative and innovative and um, creative and and that's not something you can just autocratically look at someone and say do be innovative today it doesn't work that way and so two, two, um, two things to consider when you're doing it what is your leadership style what is your primary one right what's your go-to one what's your comfort zone leadership style doesn't mean it has to disappear completely but you do have to understand how you go about it what your intent with your leadership style how it impacts the team how they perceive your actions if you're like those check marks and, and you like the details what that task oriented can mean to a team in terms of ownership is there another way to, to satisfy that motivation that drive for you and how you go about asking the questions effective questions can be just that effective and powerful but only with practice only with good intent of your leadership style and in with the intent and purpose of building collaboration if you're trying to manipulate or lead it won't work they won't be effective right people will clue into that but it isn't something that you can just say well now my I am now a leader who's behind the scenes who just out asks questions all the time doesn't really work that way and I would probably say you were not being very valuable to the team if you do that it's understanding when to use which situations and when to use which questions and that comes with experience and time just like all of the issues you can spot now for your teams as the project managers eventually you'll be able to spot them too for your leadership style and your effective questions so I want to open it up um, to questions the best way to do that is to um, actually you can either raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can enter in questions on your um, on the tab of the question of the go to webinar control panel either one will work um, and I will see it and I will um, adjust accordingly but I will open it up for any questions that you might have okay give it a couple more seconds for people in case they're typing I, can't, I don't know if I can tell if people are typing when they're doing it well I thank you very much for spending uh, this last 45 minutes with me and taking your time I appreciate it and I wish you all the best in your journeys into agile project management so I have a question might you adjust your style at the individual level a developer that is more skilled than others uh, yes absolutely um, this is where people are um, people oriented leadership can come into as well um, there's a technique Pollyanna Pixton has a technique out there ca for, uh, called boundaries and what I find is I will create a boundary and so what that is is, is a, it's almost like a cube right and I'll put boundaries on each side like anything that costs more than five hundred dollars anything that um, you know requires more than a day's worth of effort or something like that and if you're within those boundaries make decisions right there are times that I have one person that you know what is not as reliable there's other challenges there are things that are going on and their boundaries are a little tighter and I might find that I have to be more task oriented or do something here's the thing though don't make it a self-fulfilling prophecy a little bit right like 
um, make sure you're adjusting, right? It makes sense that if you have to scale back for one person um, and be more task oriented or more people oriented for somebody. But the goal should be that they're learning and growing. And if you're finding that you're still having to remain in task oriented and you're not able to get that person to um, a relatively appropriate level with the rest of the team, you're going to have a really hard time ever getting that team to high performance. There's other issues that might have to occur that's going on there because at the end of the day, teams are as strong as their weakest individual. And that's how, that's a really rough thing to say, but it's, it's true. And so um, don't compensate for that individual by doing the individual's work. You know, your focus should be on growing that individual and, and adjusting but you might absolutely have to, they might be on a different transition path, um, different lengths within those leadership styles, but your goal should still be getting to the next one, getting to another level with that. Um, yes, here, let me type out her name. Holly Anna Pixton. And I sent the her name out and 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 all of it. Um, and I believe that material that I found the boundaries from when I attended it was in a session from um, an agile conference, so an agile alliance conference. You might be able to find materials from there as well. Other questions? I. Again, thank you for spending your um, last hour with me or so. I wish you all the best. Uh, if you need anything, please reach out. Um, obviously, this is an hour, and it's just a slight touch into it, and it's much more of a, an elaborate um, topic, and hopefully you continue to explore and, and um, contribute to the topic as well. Have a great day. Thank you.